For those of you who aren't as familiar with Rick Moranis' filmography, that was a quick bite from Little Shop of Horrors, the legendary musical about killer plants. People are scared of plants, this is just a fact. In order to survive, our ancestors had to know which ones were good and which ones were bad. Some plants would cause wicked hallucinations, which would be especially terrifying if you weren't prepared for it. Poison barbs, the ability to choke and strangle, it's no wonder we've come up with all sorts of savage, scary shrubs in our literature. Hellish herbs, vengeful verdure, wicked weeds, you name it. Speaking of weeds, there's another plant we've been totally scared of for reasons that may or may not be founded. <laughs> Reefer madness, anyone? Oh boy. Back to deadly plants though, there are plenty that walk the hallowed halls of horror history. The most popular ones are usually committed to film at some point, famous examples being Audrey 2 in Little Shop of Horrors, or the strange space moss from the lonesome death of Jordi Viril. But as folks tend to do in our age of sound and color, we often forget about all the pernicious plants that populate popular literature. Whomping willows, mandrakes, other examples that don't just show up in Harry Potter. So today we're paying homage to the vegetation that thrives in the undergrowth of our collective consciousness. Hello horror heads and welcome back to the scariest channel on YouTube, Top 5 Scary Videos. I'm your horror host, Keegan Hughes, and today we're taking a look at the top 5 most terrifying plants in horror fiction. Prepare yourself, because some evil is about to take root deep, deep in your mind, pun intended. Before we begin, make sure to give this video a big thumbs up and subscribe for more fearful flora fables. Oh, and by the way, spoiler alert, a lot of these plants don't have their true abilities or intentions revealed until later in their books, so if you're interested in reading any of these, maybe skip over the entries. Okay, let's get started. Kicking us off at number 5, we have the Hungries from The Girl With All The Gifts. While technically zombies hungry for human flesh, these horrifying people eaters are actually plant based. In in this story by M.R. Carey, we're introduced to a world that has been infected by a variant of the Ophiocordyceps unilateralis fungus. I'm surprised I got that on the first try. Originally thought to only parasitize insects, it has somehow adapted to attack humans. People afflicted with the mushroomy monster will lose their mental powers and develop a taste for human flesh. This infection can be spread through bodily fluids, including saliva and blood. So classic zombie rules, but with a bit of a twist. If left long enough, the spores will actually sprout fruiting bodies on their hosts and then release more spores into the atmosphere, which will spread much faster than biting ever could. They almost kinda sorta remind me of the infected from The Last of Us. On top of the whole spores in the air thing, we also have the caveat of some children being infected but remaining sapient and sentient. This causes all sorts of moral dilemmas and changes the end of world scenario immensely. If these children can live like normal people, just with an additional taste for raw flesh, what are we supposed to do with them? Our book's main character, Melanie, is one of those cognizant hungries. She has to adapt to her own hunger and work with other humans in order to protect those she loves and survive. This makes for some wonderfully tense moments between her and assorted survivors and researchers, who are often torn between trusting her and using her to their advantage and wanting to kill her. It's a hard life for a mushroom person out here. Coming in at number 4, we have Okoes from The Caretaker of Lauren Field. This book by Dave Zeltzerman is a short and sweet read, and it kinda reads like an episode of The Twilight Zone. The killer plants are a huge deal to our main character, but maybe not so much to everyone else. This is a psychological horror with a potentially unreliable narrator, Jack Durkin. He is the latest in a long line of Durkins who have been tasked with weeding Lauren Field. The weeds seem normal to any outsider, but the Durkins know that they are really Okoes a race of terrible plant monsters who will destroy humanity as we know it if allowed to grow too large. Plenty of moving parts in this story will keep you unsure as to whether or not these monster plants are real or not. If they are real, it's bad news for everyone, especially those who don't believe. But if they aren't real, it still doesn't bode too well as our main character and many before him have suffered from grand delusions. The position of Lauren Field caretaker used to be one of great respect, but over time has been dismissed as just superstitious. Townsfolk and family alike scoff at Jack as he spends his day meticulously weeding the fields. Soon enough, Jack's family starts to work against him, looking for an exit, a way into a new life. And if they were to leave, they would likely be happier, but would the world come to an abrupt end? Would Jack be able to leave the field, or would the paranoia and obsession anchor him there? Horror, mystery, and a little bit of Stephen King all come together to make this book a tense, slow burn. The Aquaese will haunt your dreams. Keep weeding, Jack. Coming in at number 3, we've got the Green God from the Horror Under Warrentown. Of course there's a Lovecraftian plant god. Ramsey Campbell, horror author extraordinaire, came up with this horrific monstrosity for his book, The Horror Under Warrentown. In the original book, it had no name, but eventually gained the title of 
the green god when added to the game The Call of Cthulhu. Residing in an underground labyrinth, it resembles an Easter Island head covered in plant matter. However, it isn't simply covered in the dense vegetation, it is entirely comprised of it. This big old dome is capable of sending out long, viney appendages, which it employs to grab victims or offer communion to its degenerate cult of mutant worshippers. That doesn't seem too bad, especially because it can't get so far, right? Well, it has another ability. The transmutation of anyone who partakes in its flesh. Anyone who consumes it will slowly transform into a disgusting, rabbit-like creature. Hopping, degenerate mutants covered in coarse, dark hair with elongated ears, large eyes, and rodent-like teeth. Peter Cottontail, these are not. They avoid light and prefer to live in warrens near their green god. Once transformed, they take on the purpose of expanding the horror's cult. They do this by offering up seemingly innocent veggies to normal humans. Once eaten, these innocent, healthy eaters will slowly change into one of the monstrosities, as if there weren't enough reasons for kids not to want to eat their greens. Coming in at number two, the Triffids from the Day of the Triffids. Human made horrors tend to be pretty effective, don't you think? Hubris and whatnot. Unlike in the movie adaptation, which had the Triffids come from outer space, John Winham's book has them genetically engineered by humans. In fact, there's even a little Cold War bioweapon paranoia slipped in. So the good folks down at the vegetable lab bred some tall, venomous, carnivorous plants capable of locomotion because they have valuable oils and nothing could possibly go wrong. Of course, something does go wrong. Our comfy position at the top of the food chain is compromised when a beautiful and bright meteor shower touches down, blinding everyone but a select handful of humans. Our protagonist is one of the lucky sighted left to live in a world of the sightless. The Triffids end up being only part of the problem as a mysterious plague breaks out among the blind and many folks forcefully enlist those with sight into being slaves for the newly blind. Some of these plot points equivocate blind people to completely useless dependents, which is sort of odd, but I guess the new world order would just immediately collapse if all the sudden people couldn't see. There's definitely no way to avoid that. A product of the times, perhaps. The story is more about the restructuring of society post biohazard, but the Triffids are a real threat indeed. These seven foot viney villains can kill folks with a single whip of their venomous vines and are apt to make blind people easy pickings. I just wish their names were a little scarier. Triffid doesn't sound like a plant that's gonna come and dissolve my bones. Sounds like something grandma would grow in her garden. <laughs> Maybe that's part of it. Finally at number one, the vines from the ruins. Oh yeah. These are some nasty suckers. They'll infiltrate your body, they'll burn you with acid, they'll imitate your friends and then laugh as you scream. Yikes. In this book by Scott Smith, we follow a group of friends vacationing in Mexico. They end up on a vine covered hill surrounded by barren earth and soon realize that the locals are not going to let them out alive. Upon finding the body of another tourist overgrown with vines, they realize that these same locals are very afraid of the native flora. One by one, each of the pals is taken down in gruesome style by the vines. One's lured into a pit by the sound of a cell phone, only to realize that the vines are capable of imitating any sounds they hear. This plays out later with the vines pretending to be other other members of the group after they've been killed. So not only are the vines predatory, they are sadistic and manipulative as well. Sheesh. They're also able to infest their victims through open wounds, crawling into their bodies like a wormy parasite. Imagine knowing that acidic vines could be sliding their way through your body under your skin. Kind of makes you want to die, doesn't it? Well, that's the route some of the characters took after all, begging their comrades to kill them in order to escape the madness. Don't go into this book expecting a happy end for everyone, it gets real dark. These vines are pretty good at hiding evidence, allowing new victims to stumble in unaware. Oh no. Forget beasts, plants are scary as hell. Makes me take a second look at my fruit and veg intake. What do you think? Any famous fictional flowers I left off the list? Let me know down in the comments. Speaking of comments, let's take a look at some of your more ferocious ones from our last video, the most disturbing horror movie monster transformations. Ashley Brown says, I've seen a lot of jacked up things in my time, immune to most everything. Justin Long as a walrus, not immune to that. I feel the same way. Most stuff feels pretty boilerplate until you run into something that absolutely ruins your day. Love to stumble across those. Red Nightshade says, yeah, these are pretty scary, but nothing is scarier than when I run out of coffee. Scary for you or the people around you? Do you fall into a deep psychosis or go on a murderous rampage? I need to know. Richard Clark says, I was so sure Brundlefly was going to be number one, but well done for not being predictable. I figured we had seen Jeff Goldblum and the fly on a bunch of other lists. Why not take a look at an equally terrifying, less scientific transformation by Cronenberg? Nerd says, introductions are too long. Whatever you say, nerd. <laughs> 
And Sarah Hervison says, Video Drome predicted the dark web. Among other things, entertainment becoming more depraved, being more turned on by screens than people, the new flesh, a prescient flick to say the least. That's all the time we have for today. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. Let's rock and roll. Let's do both of those things. And which ones were bad? I have something in my eye. It might be a plant. It's that populate, populate. Why did I write that? <laughs> <coughs> well, that's the route some of the characters took, actually. Well, that's the route.